everybody and welcome to another ASMR video here on the channel. Today we have the return of the ever popular scary reddit stories. Today I am on the no sleep reddit page and we're going to read some of these no sleep stories to hopefully help you get some sleep or at least relax you and scare you at the at the same time. I've got a number of stories here that hopefully will take us to over the one hour mark. That is the aim for this video because well because you guys deserve it and why not? And plus I thoroughly enjoy these videos and I literally I try and bit stories that are relatively high rated have an interesting title and then I'll skim read but realistically we're we're I'm reading them and you're hearing them for the first time together we're, we're in this together I figured I'd try and go a little bit closer to the mic this evening and I think I might test out some rain sounds or maybe some crickets or something while we're reading the story so You'll have to let me know if that's something you like down below. I won't have it super overbearing, just hopefully like a nice background sound adding to the sort of atmosphere we're building with these scary stories. But let's, uh, I reckon let's waste no more time. Let's get into story number one. So this first story is titled The Volkov Experiment. It was the highest rated story from the last few days. Uh, it's got 1.3 thousand upvotes and it's only been up a day so let's see if it's any good. So, the Volkov experiment. Did anyone who lived in Seattle in the 90s remember Dr. Volkov's children's laboratory? I don't remember the specific town near Seattle. My mum and I moved around a lot but I definitely remember Dr. Yonkov I remember hearing his commercials on the radio. I remember he said he'd give whatever families would let him borrow their kids something like $100,000. Which honestly sounds super suspicious, but hey, my mum was a single parent who just needed some cash. I was eight years old, I think, when she first signed me up, and one of the most vivid memories from this was walking into the lab for the first time. It actually looked pretty fun. It was like a giant playground with slides and swings and anything else a dirty little kid would want to get their hands on. There were three other kids there and we played hide and seek together while our parents chatted and signed some papers. Then Dr. Volkov came in. He had a very strong accent which I couldn't place at the time but I now recognise as Russian. I'm not going to do a Russian accent. Hello families. I thank you for giving up your free time to take part in my studies. I assure you, if I am successful with these experiments, we will make history, he said. And the parents gave a polite applause. Us kids got on to and gave our cheers, which were not as quiet. Once the parents leave, I will take the children and start my studies. They should each be returned to you within the next year, give or take. He said, and the parents murmured to each other. Once again, thank you for your sacrifices. I will see the parents off now. Farewell. Children say goodbye to mummy or daddy, Dr. Volkov said. We all waved goodbye, except for one girl. who ran up to her dad and hugged him. I wish I had done that now too. After the parents left, Dr. Volkov, Dr. Volkov turned to us. Hello little ones, I am so excited to work with you. Now, follow me. We followed him into the lab, which was decidedly less fun than the front of his lab. It was all white with five rooms and big metal doors decorated the sides of the hallway, one for each kid. There was some strange equipment that I didn't know the names of. There were four kids, three boys including me and one girl. We introduced ourselves. There was Michael, me and Dalton who were both eight. Then there were 
was Cassandra, who was nine, and the oldest, Andrew, was ten. Dr. Yorkham explained uh, we'd still have time to play together an hour a day, but most of our time was to be spent working on our experiments. Dalton raised his hand. What's the experiment? Dr. Volkov smiled, a smile that looked almost fake. Who here has ever wanted to have superpowers? All four of us went ballistic. We all wanted to be heroes. What have I told you that is made possible with us? That's right, over the course of a year, I will make you fall into a group of superhumans, each with your own special power. All of us clapped. This sounded amazing. And with that, we were sent to our rooms. The interior of mine was strange. No toys, posters or race car beds like the one I had at home. There were a lot of lights though, but a lot of them weren't on for some reason. I was tired, so I lay down in my little bed, decorated with lightning bolts, and went to sleep. The next day, Dr. Volker taught us more about the experiment. He was going to condition us all to have superpowers and then make a sort of super team to fight bad guys. We all had different superpowers. I was going to get the power to manipulate energy, which made my room make a whole lot more sense. Dalton would be able to talk to the dead, Cassandra would be immortal, and Andrew was going to gain the strength of a gorilla, which we all thought was hilarious when we first heard it. Training was to begin immediately, and they sent us all away to separate rooms. This sounds like the Umbrella Academy. I was sat in a large chair where on one of where on of Dr. Volkov's assistants named Katya sat with me. Hello Michael, how are you doing? We're going to make you into a super boy. Isn't that exciting? Now this may hurt a little bit. Without warning, she pulled a lever and the chair I was sitting on suddenly lit up. I'd been shocked by an electric chair and began to cry. Do not worry, little boy. It will not kill you, but it will make you strong. Don't you want electricity powers? I thought about it, and even though it hurt, electricity powers started to sound really cool. I nodded and she shocked me again. I cried. And that was my life for the next while, getting shocked, crying, and getting shocked again. Until one day, maybe two or so months later, when they tried something different. Here, yeah, hold this, Michael, Katya said, handing me a metal rod. This will hopefully conduct enough electricity to go through you and power that light bulb. Put your hand on the light bulb, Michael. I obliged. Now... Ready, three, two, one. She then shot the rod, which sent electricity through me and into the light bulb. It hurt, but not as much as it should have. Katya smiled and called Dr. Volkov into my laboratory. He was elated. It worked, child. See, all the days of training you to be resistant to electricity worked. Now we can continue our experiment. And your free time for the day go play. It wasn't until then when I went to play with the other kids, I noticed the changes. We all looked weirder, less normal. Dalton kept on whispering to nobody and wouldn't really talk to us. Andrew looked weirdly buff and kept climbing on things. And Cassandra honestly looked kind of scary. She looked all stitched together like a ragdoll. As Dalton stood by himself, Cassandra and Andrew and I sat and talked. I don't like these experiments, it's scary, Andrew said. They keep on giving me shots and then I have to lift weights. It hurts my arms. I later learned that the shots they were giving him were injecting him with gorilla DNA, which is terrifying to me. I'm scared too. They keep on hurting me. Every time a part of me dies, they stitch on a new one. See? Cassandra lifted her shirt, revealing part of her stomach had been stitched back on. They say that if we do it enough times, I'll be immortal. Did you 
you see what they're doing to Dalton? My room is next to his, I hear it all the time. They make him sit with dead bodies, and then they all talk to them. It scares him a lot. I looked over to Dalton. He had big circles around his eyes and looked pale and gaunt. I wonder if he had secretly been replaced by one of the dead bodies. That night, something weird happened. I was awoken by a bunch of red flashing lights and alarms. Something was wrong in the laboratory. Catchy came and carried me out of bed, and I saw other workers carrying the other kids out of bed too. Everyone except Dalton. We heard a bunch of screaming from another room as the three of us were ushered into our playroom. I held Cassandra's hand and Andrew stood in front of us trying to protect us. I have to join them, I have to join them, they told me. We heard him yell as Dr. Volkov's voice desperately tried to calm him down. Screams and then silence. For a long time we slept on the stuffed animals in the playroom that night. We never saw Dalton after that and his door was boarded up. At the time I just assumed his mum took him home. But they didn't give us much time to look for him because all of us had more experiments the same day. Michael, do you remember when you did a great job but with that experiment and you made the light bulb light up? Well, that was a practice round. Next month, we're going to do the real deal. We're going to put metal plates in your hands to make it so that you can conduct energy even without holding the metal rod. Doesn't that sound great, Katya said. I squirmed in my seat. Y yeah, I lied. We did more training. I will say, the shocks hurt so much less than the first time. It definitely was getting easier. As time went on, things got even more weird. Cassandra and I's room were right next to each other, so we would see each other a lot. She kept on getting more and more stitched up. One time while we were playing in the playroom, we noticed Andrew wasn't there, which worried us. I heard Dr. Volkov and Andrew's worker Alexei talking. They said that he's acting strange, like a monkey. He's climbing everywhere and attacks them if they get too close. He doesn't even talk anymore, Cassandra said, adjusting a stitched piece of skin on her face. Oh, how's your experiment going? I asked. Not very good. They say I'm making progress and that the stuff they're giving me in shots is working. They say it's a chemical that makes people's endurance better. I think that's the word they used, but they still have to stitch me up sometimes. I don't know if it's really working though. All they've been doing is hitting me with things and cutting me with things. Not even actually killing me, she said. I looked at her arm. To my surprise, it had been completely sewn back on. That sucks. Mine's not going too good either. I don't even have electric electricity powers yet. I thought I would by now. This place is getting boring. I'm sick of the playroom. Let's go exploring, Cassandra said, pulling me up from my seat as a stitch fell loose on her arm. I tried to resist, but she was strong. She dragged me through the halls, which were empty. I guess the workers were on their breaks. It was like a maze in there when we went past the children's ward, a.k.a. our ward. We saw a bunch of medical stuff that looked weird. It looked fancy and official. There was a door at the end of the hallway which Cassandra pulled me into. Inside we found a bunch of documents. We picked them up and started to read them. The Volkov experiment, she read out loud, conducted to test the limits of the human body and mind mentally and physically. Subjects, and it listed the subjects. Keep reading, I insisted. Subjects will be repeatedly tortured under the vows of being trained for greatness. The rue, sorry. They will be injected with placebo shots, beaten, electrocuted, forced to endure heavy physical activities, and locked in rooms with dead bodies. This experiment will test the theory formed by Dr. Dmitry Yolkov that if children are subjected to torture while well, under the assumption the result will be positive, along with being given positive reinforcement from mentors. They will experience less or different traumatic responses to said torture. We looked at each other. So you mean, we're not so 
superheroes? I asked. Tears formed in Cassandra's eyes, and we heard footsteps somewhere in the hallway. We'd better get going, she said, grabbing my hand as more stitches fell loose in her arms. We raced down the hall and back into the playroom just as Katia walked in. Bedtime, children, she said, and she took us to our rooms where she tucked me into bed. I didn't sleep at all that night. The next day is when all hell broke loose. During free time, Cassandra and I decided to check on Andrew, who hadn't left his room in days. Andrew, hello, we said, opening the unlocked door. What I saw in there will haunt me for the rest of my life. He was going, no pun intended, apeshit, climbing on the walls of his room. His eyes were glazed like he had no idea what was going on. He wasn't even talking, just grunting and screaming. We ran to get an attendant. Katya, Andrew's crazy. The gorilla DNA you put in him was working, I said. And Katya ran to hide us in the playroom. Andrew had escaped his room. Cassandra and I pressed our ears to the door, trying to listen in. Subject 4 is reacting poorly to the gorilla DNA, Dr. Volkov, Katya reported, as they tried to track down Andrew. No, no, impossible, Dr. Volkov said. We didn't give him any gorilla DNA. It was a placebo. He said, and even though at that age I didn't know what a placebo was, Cassandra and I still looked at each other in shock. That's fascinating. Let me write this down, we heard him say. No, Dr. Volkov, there's no time. There is a breach in his room. He is somewhere in the building, Katya said, panicked. No, let me, Dr. Volkov. Subjects two and three are in danger, and so are we. There is no time. It won't take Dr. Volkov. And then suddenly we heard screaming and running in chaos. I guess Andrew had found them. When everything was quiet, Cassandra carefully opened the door to the playroom. Dr. Volkov and Katya, or at least what remained of them, were lying on the floor in a mess of blood. Andrew, in the corner, hyperventilating. He turned around and rushed towards us. Cassandra screamed and he stopped in front of us. A Andrew, I said shakily, not even expecting him to say anything. Go. You're free. He hissed, and Cassandra and I stood there in shock. Are you stupid? They're coming. Go before they get you, he said. And only then did we notice the men in biohazard suits running towards us. Cassandra and I ran and ran until we found the exit into the playground at the front of the building. We heard gunshots behind us and Andrew's screams. But we didn't care. All we could do was run out the door, out of the hellhole we had been in for months. We waited outside the door for a while, waiting for Andrew to come out after us, but he never did. That was the last I saw of the Volkov experiment. No documents were ever published, no police reports, nothing. Cassandra and I went our separate ways, back to our families, and soon Mum and I moved out. Sometimes I wonder if I dreamt the whole thing. But last week at the coffee shop, I saw a girl with strange stitches up and down her body, and as she left with her drink, we made eye contact, and I knew she recognised me too. I guess some things you just can't make up. Well, that wasn't particularly scary, but a very, very unsettling and most importantly well-written story, I would say. Thoroughly enjoyed that. I think for the next one, let's try and pick one that's a little bit more scary. This story is titled My Brother Has Locked In Syndrome and Hasn't Been Able to Speak in Years. Last night, I caught him talking to the devil. At 17, my brother Brad had a stroke and woke up trapped in his body. The doctors diagnosed him with locked in syndrome, a rare neurological disease that paralyzes all muscles except those that control eye movement. If you ask me, it's a worse fate than death. Before his stroke, Brad was everything I wanted to be. 
athletic, outgoing, and a hit with the ladies. I was the complete inverse. My classmates were shocked when they found out we were related. Brad and I had a strained relationship. I was envious of what he had, and he was ashamed of what I was. A social outcast with a pension for saying the wrong thing. I'd like to say we grew closer after his diagnosis, but we didn't. His well-being became my parents' obsession and eventually destroyed their marriage. Our family was in tatters and I didn't hide my resentment. Brad knew it and his hatred for me grew. Sometimes I'd be tasked with changing his clothes and if my mum was too tired, his diaper as well. The stares he gave me made my blood run cold. His eyes were bits of darkness. I knew he wanted me dead without a word passing from his lips. It didn't help that my life changed for the better as his went the other way. I started to lift weights and grew into my lanky frame. The girls started to notice me and I made friends with the popular kids. I became the new Brad, even hanging out with some of his old buddies. Brad seethed with jealous rage. I could feel it bursting from his every pore. I'm sure he felt like I stole his life, and in a way I did. The truth was that Brad was getting sick. Getting sick was the best thing that ever happened to me. That all changed on one fateful night. I'd stumbled home late from a party at Brad's ex-girlfriend's house, who I was hooking up with. I was tipsy and beaming with joy. As I passed by Brad's room, I stopped dead in my tracks. Hush whispers floated into the hallway. I can give you it all back. Everything you lost can be reclaimed, but nothing in life is free. Are you willing to pay the price? Yes. What a pleasure to hear such a smart boy. Let me give you a taste of what's to come. This one's on the house. I stood frozen in the hallway. What was I hearing? I got my ear to the door and listened intently. Joyful sobs echoed from his room. I don't care what the price is. I'll do anything. This is worth it. I took a step back and covered my mouth to repress a shocked squeal. That was Brad's voice. There was no mistaking it. It's deep and gruff edges were unmistakable. I thought you'd feel that way. God has taken so much from you and I'm here to give it back. All I ask is a soul for a soul, blood for blood. Gladly, I've been dreaming of this moment for years. But steps crept across the bedroom floor. The way they bounced against the hardwood sounded like clocks. A rush of cold air passed over me. The lights in the house flickered. Shadows twisted and reveled in the darkness. It is done. You have half an hour. If a soul has not been claimed by then, your body becomes a prison once again. Not a problem. You'll have your soul. Blood will be spilled and I'll be the one to do it. My heart started racing and my muscles tensed. I snuck into my room, turning the lock, holding my breath. I slid under my bed and gripped a pocket knife I kept in my bedside drawer. Brad was a mountain of a man. If he gunning for me, I stood no chance against him. My best bet was to hide and pray to whoever would listen. The man was an animal. The junkyard dog was off the leash and I was red meat. Footsteps raced down the hall and lurched to a stop in front of my room. Hey bro, you're not going to believe this, I'm cured. It's a miracle. Let me in, I want to show you the new me. I didn't budge, my limbs quivered with fear. I embraced the darkness as a shield of protection. Didn't you hear me? I'm all better. Come on and let me in. I want to have a brother to brother chat. We're long overdue. His tone was sickly sweet. I remained quiet. My fingers rubbed fiercely around the handle of the pocket knife.
entity pointed a skeletal figure down the hall. Heart racing, I made my way to my mother's room. I pushed open the door and screamed. My mum was dead. A frothy substance pulled around her mouth. An overturned cup of tea lay next to her. Her limbs were splayed in a tortured position. She died horribly, that much was clear. The deal has been accepted. Two brothers damned to the same fate. I'll make my leave now. See you soon. Sooner than you think. Hey bro, have you seen mum? A cold hand clutched my shoulder and the world started to spin. That was a good one. That was pretty good. I'm just sort of thinking, would I take that deal? Definitely not to kill my own mum. And while my brothers do test me sometimes, yeah, I'm still probably won't take it. Right, let's move on to the third story now. Okay, this story is titled Last Summer I Opened an Adventure Park. After some unexplainable tragedies, we permanently closed the gates. Have you ever seen We Bought a Zoo? I love that movie. I used to love that film. I repeatedly watched it when I was a kid and I truly envied Matt Damon. I wanted to be him. Maybe I just wanted Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> yeah, fair. I don't know, I'm getting sidetracked. I was once transfixed by the pristine Polaroid of the American dream that Wee Balder Zoo created, even though the story was based on a British family. Maybe Hollywood Zoo had purchased the rights to my tale of a dilapidated park's renovation. I have a hunch it might not reach the pitching floor. Now, obviously, any abandoned place is creepy. Wee Balder Zoo added whimsy and wonder to the experience, but that wasn't realistic. Was an eerie atmosphere to the derelict farm that I transformed into my adventure park. Perhaps it was compound, compounded by the fact that I didn't have Scarlett Johansson by my side, but I mean, this guy really likes Scarlett Johansson. I wasn't entirely alone. My family came to my aid. We hired people and brought my vision of an adventure park back to life. For obvious reasons, I'm going to change names throughout this post. My sister Josie was magnificent. My friend Paul was a lifesaver in every meaning of the word. Uncle Ron, however, just wanted a slice of the pie. Anyway, I want to talk about the horrible events that led to the closure of my park, beginning with the ghost train incident. We opened the park gates in June. May was a manic month, as you can probably imagine. I was hiring as many people as possible to get everything up and running. There was so much to do that I could hardly keep on top of every single problem. Tess worked on the ghost train ride. She was setting up decorations and lighting throughout the tunnels. On Friday night in May, she came running to me in floods of tears. Gary, the train engineer, had gone home early, leaving Tess on her lonesome in the darkened tunnel. She had the fright of her life when she spotted something that she didn't put there. An animatronic in a purple pinafore. Tess described the machine as a short girl with a grey face, baby blue eyes and the menacing youth of a metallic nutcracker. It was nearly ten in the evening and I was too tired to deal with yet another issue. Some of the other late night workers teased Tess and I admit that I thought she must just be confused. I assumed that another member of staff had installed the animatronic. Begrudgingly, a few of us accompanied Des to the ghost train tunnels, and we were unsurprised to find no sign of her mechanical ghoul. The girl was distraught, and I originally thought that was due to the incessant mocking from her co-workers. But Tess told me something after the others had left. She said the animatronic spoke. The mechanical girl said things that only Tess knew about herself. 
the machine made callous remarks, but its comments soon escalated to terrible threats. That was what had shaken Tess up. I told her it was probably a horrible prank from one of her co-workers. She didn't come into work the next day, and nobody could get in contact with her. We just assumed the girl had quit without saying anything. I feared the financial burden of her harassment lawsuit due to the workplace bullying. But what actually happened was worse. The following day, Tess's mother came into the office and spoke to Paul. Eloy later told me that her daughter had been missing since Friday night. The mother was wondering whether anyone had seen her go home. We hadn't. The entire situation gave me chills. Uncle Ron was simply peeved that Tess had left us in the lurch right before opening. But I had a dreadful feeling about the whole situation. That sickening bit in my stomach was only deepened by Paul's incessant comments about the farm being built on unhallowed ground. Old local tales. He had warned me not to purchase the abandoned land. I explored the ghost train ride for clues as to the girl's disappearance. I didn't find Tess, but what I did find was something that was perhaps much, much worse. The animatronic. It was real. The machine with a malicious smile hadn't been there when Tess led us through the tunnels. I hadn't believed it actually existed. Seeing it with my own eyes, I have never in my life been quite so petrified. Her purple pinafore most horrifyingly was covered in blood. I cried in terror and immediately fled the tunnels. Uncle Ron urged me to keep quiet about the entire ordeal. He forced me back into the ghost train building and we dragged the animatronic outside. My uncle loaded the unnatural machine onto the back of his truck and coldly warned me to keep my lips sealed. He wasn't going to let a prank ruin his investment, even though I had invested far more into the park. A few weeks later, we opened to the public. Next we move on to D11, ILD, seat 11, the cursed seat. The jousting performance was one of our most popular attractions and people were far too enthralled by the knights and jesters to notice the woman in D11 who was hit in the face with an airborne child's shoe. The culpable child who had thrown his shoe behind him in excitement was forced to apologise, but the fuss quickly dissipated. The bloody-nosed woman left to clean herself up. It was Josie who first made a comment about the seat being cursed. The following week we faced a slightly more serious incident in D11. A young boy viol violently choked on his sandwich. Fortunately, somebody dislodged the food item. But the boy's ribs were broken in the midst of the commotion. His unconscious body was carried out on a stretcher, but I heard he did make a full recovery. So two days later, something happened that finally prompted us to get rid of the seat. Paul tore it from the cement. I'm not a superstitious person, but the final incident was horrifying enough to make me question the very nature of the universe. Sitting in D11, a young man. It was perfectly healthy, according to reports and local rumours. Suffered a fatal heart attack. Coroners had little to say, allegedly. These things happen. They happened far too often in D11. Next one is titled Blind Spot. This was the penultimate event to the tragedy which led to my park's closure. Two children went missing on the obstacle course in the woods. Nobody's sure how they could have possibly vanished. There were so many people around. The woods were fenced, as was the entire park. The two boys simply slipped between some trees and were never seen again. On the leaf-strewn clearing in which they disappeared, 
we found something inexplicably dreadful. Two child-sized mannequins lay on the ground, and they were wearing the clothes of the missing children. We end with the blueberry man. There are, this is something direful that only came to light after the park's closure, and it certainly sparked a serious inquest. Many people still link this incident to the tragedy of the missing children from the obstacle course. I'm not so sure about that, but it's certainly a terrible story, though. The Blueberry Man was not a member of my staff. My employees and I first became aware of his existence when children started to excitedly gush about delicious blueberry ice creams and even blueberry pies that they had enjoyed at our park. At first, I would chuckle at the bizarreness of such comments. We didn't sell blueberry products of any kind. Yes, you do, one kid told me. The blueberry man stand is behind the bedding farm. Members of staff tirelessly searched for this illegal stand, but nobody ever found the blueberry man behind the farm. Weeks later, after the park closed, a man was arrested for the kidnapping and murder of a child. In his basement, alongside a corpse that was mutilated beyond recognition, there were dubs of blueberries in a small fridge. What truly haunts me is that one of the corresponding officers, who was a friend of mine, said the man blubbered and insisted it wasn't his fault. He said something in the woods made him do it. Something old. The park closed as the result of many horrifying incidents. I'll boast about the other terrible things that happened. That being said, I don't know whether I have the courage to tell the tale of the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm also not sure that you would want to know it. I don't know about you, but I, I most certainly... I definitely, definitely want the night. Now, I reckon we've probably got time for one more long one. So, it's just which one. I'm going to do this one. The Peekaboo Killer 911 Transcripts. So, this is like a transcript, so I'm going to flick between speakers. I would do exciting voices if I wasn't whispering, but you can, I'm sure you can figure it out. Initial 911 call came in at 10.57pm on the 12th of November 2020. 911, what's the nature of your emergency? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's an emergency, but could you please send someone? Do you need police or is this a medical emergency? Could you just send an officer out? I mean... I don't know. It might just be some kids messing around or something, but... The caller goes quiet for a few seconds. Hello? I'd feel better if someone came out to check. What is your address? 1056. Redacted. And what is your name? It's Erin Feller. Okay, Erin. I have officers on the way. What's going on? Well, I was calling my dog in from the backyard, and she was growling at something out there. I couldn't see what, though. I finally got her to come inside, and the second I closed the door and locked it, something smacked into the glass window. Not hard enough to break it, but was hard enough to rattle the door. What time was this? About five minutes ago. Were you able to see anyone? No, there's blinds on my back door, and they were down, but I heard the doorknob jiggling a few times before I called you. Caller tries to acquire a dog who can be heard growling. I yelled and I was calling the police and the noises stopped, but like I said, it, it, it could be kids, but I, I just don't know. Okay, and have you heard any other noises since then? No, just the door, but my dog is still growling. Okay, I have an officer en route to you, Erin. Are the doors and windows locked? Yes, they're locked. Alright, an officer should be out to you shortly. Stay inside and keep the doors locked until the officer arrives, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Call ended. O officer Collier was dispatched to the location. He saw no signs of any person. 
cousins around the property, he did know that the dog was still anxious and growling at the back door. He advised Miss Vella to keep her door locked and call if she should see or hear anything else. 911 call comes in at 1.27am, the 12th of December. 911, what is your emergency? It's me again. Can you send an officer back out, please? Caller is in obvious distress, breathing rapidly. Is this 41056 redacted? Yes, someone was just looking through my front window. Can you just send someone? I have an officer en route to you. You said you saw someone looking through your windows. Yes, I was in bed, but Ginger, my dog, ran to the front door, growling. I pulled up the blinds a bit, but didn't see anything at first. Then I saw a face pop up. But just the top of their head and eyes, like they were playing peekaboo or something. I screamed and Ginger started barking and going nuts. And the person popped down out of view again. How long ago was this? A few minutes ago. They popped up again just before I called you, but they went back down under the window. I'm in my bedroom now. Did you recognise the person, ma'am? No, I only saw their eyes and the top of their head, but they looked... I don't know, like... a mime or something. A mime? Yes, white makeup on their face and head. Really disturbing. Okay, I want you to stay on the phone with me until the officer arrives. Just stay in your room until you hear them. Okay. Does your bedroom have a lock? Yes, it's locked. Dispatch stayed on the line with Miss Vella until officers arrived. Officers arrived and announced themselves 11 minutes later and the call was terminated. Officers Copeland and Laurie arrived on scene to find Erin Vella in great distress. Miss Vella claimed to have seen a mime at her door. Officers noted that Ms. Vella did not seem to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. She seemed anxious but lucid. Ms. Vella pointed out to the officers where she'd seen the suspect peering through her window. The glass had no visible marks on it other than a smear of white paint. Officers were able to see two impressions in the dirt just underneath the windowsill outside the laundry room. Officers stated the impressions looked as if someone had been standing barefoot on the tips of their toes. Officers checked the area and the field surrounding the home and found a trail of footprints leading away from the home to the woods behind Miss Vella's home. When followed, the footprints seemed to be erratic and moving around in a zigzag pattern. The prints stopped abruptly at a large tree there were no signs of any persons in the tree. The footprints looked to be made by someone who was barefoot and walking solely on their toes. Officers checked the woods but found nothing of note. Officers spoke with the closest neighbours a half mile down the road. The neighbours stated they hadn't heard or seen anything out of the ordinary. Officers reminded Miss Vella to keep her doors locked and advised her to call back if the person returned. 911 call came in at 3.41am on the 12th of the 12th, 2020. 911, what is your number? I need the police now. The sound of the call... Sorry, caller is in obvious distress. The sound of a dog can be heard barking in the background. Is this 41056 redacted? Yes, I just saw that person looking in my bedroom window. I was asleep and had tapping on my window, and when I looked up, that face was pressed up against the glass. How long before the police get here? Caller can be heard breathing rapidly, and sounds as if she's moving around the house. I have officers en route to you now, Miss Bella. Can you lock yourself in your bedroom? No, it was still tapping on the glass when I left. It keeps smiling at me. I'm upstairs in my office. It has a lock. Caller tries to calm a dog. Okay, Erin, it was smiling at me. I like mouthing words or something, but I don't know what. They didn't have eyelids. Okay, Erin, just stay calm. Officers are not far from you. I don't understand why. Caller goes quiet and the 
the sound of a dog growling can be heard. Are you there? Erin whispering, I heard something. I think they're in the house. You can stay quiet if you need to, I'm still on the line. It's... it sounds like... Wait. A muffled metallic sound can be heard, followed by a scream and barking. Oh my god. Caller screams and sounds to be running. A door slams. Ginger, Ginger, come here. Sobbing. Erin, are you alright? Can you tell me what's happening? A full minute passes with no response to dispatcher's questions. Caller can be heard trying to calm her dog. Erin, I'm in. Hello. I'm here. I'm in the downstairs bathroom. Where are the police? Caller is out of breath. They're four minutes out, Erin. They're doing their best to get to you as fast as they can. Just try and remain calm. You're doing great. It got inside the vent. I... God. Erin, did you say the person was inside your vents? Can you clarify what you mean? Caller is speaking quietly. Like the vent that he comes out of. I heard something moving in there and I bent down to flip over the vent and saw that white face staring out. Caller sounds to be hyperventilating. How big are your air vents, Erin? The standard size, I don't know. Six inches or so. Not big enough for a person to crawl through. But they did. They did. Okay, take deep breaths. Officers are less than two minutes out. Oh my god, why is it taking so long? Just keep the door locked and... I think... Caller goes quiet. Whispering. I hear it moving around in the vents. Tapping on it. It's okay to remain quiet. I'm here. Do you have anything you can use as a weapon? I... I have the towel bar. Erin screams. Oh my god. It's poking its fingers through. A door slams, followed by screams and high-pitched laughter. Caller sounds to be running. Laughing grows louder and louder, almost mechanical in nature. Call ends. Officers McQuarrie and Bate arrived on scene approximately 56 seconds later. The front door was open prior to their arrival and there were obvious signs of a struggle throughout the home. Officers called out to Miss Bella but did not get a response. Officer Babe found the dog in the downstairs laundry room staring into the air vent and whimpering. The dog had obvious cuts and scrapes around its snout and balls from attempting to enter the air vent. Traces of white makeup were found on most of the windows in the home on the inside of the glass. After a thorough investigation, officers collected blood and hair samples inside four of the vents throughout the home, along with fingernails that were embedded in one of the grates. More traces of white paint were found inside all of the vents in the home. Hair samples matched the hair length and colour of Ms. Fellows. It is noted that all of the vents in the home were measured at 6 times 10 inches. Much too small for a person to move through or even fit inside. To date, Ms. Fella is still missing and there is a reward for any information leading to her whereabouts. That was a good one. That was a really good one, actually. I think I'm... I'm probably most relieved about the dog surviving, to be... to be entirely honest. But, uh, yeah, that was definitely a good one. I don't actually know if we're at the one hour mark just
just yet, so I think I'm gonna find a quick one just to keep this video going. So we're gonna end this video with a story called I Saw Something in My Bathroom Mirror This Evening. I can't say I've ever been one for looking in the mirror. Sure, when I get ready in the morning I take a glance, but that's about as far as it goes. But tonight, tonight I stepped out of the shower and there it was. Something strange, something different. The room was thick with steam. I could hardly make out the shapes of the sink and the cabinet. But there, in the misted glass of the mirror, I stepped closer and wiped away some of the condensation with my hand. Peering through the fog, looking at the reflection. It was off. Something about it felt off like there was something in the room with me. I stood there for a little while, staring into the mirror, and the more I looked at my reflection, the more I knew something was very wrong with it. I blinked and shook my head, but I couldn't shake the feeling. Sure, he moved as I moved, his face contorting in the same ugly way as mine. And yeah, he frowned along with me, his eyes darting around exactly the same, but it wasn't me. It was not me. I took a step closer and tried to get a better look, and he stepped closer with me. Who are you? We whispered together, voices barely audible. I don't know, we replied, uncertain, low and hollow. What do you want? A good question, I thought, but we had nothing more to say. He just stared back at me with a blank expression. I knew I should leave, but I was mesmerised by his presence. I wanted to talk more too, but I found that no sound would come out anymore. And then finally he spoke for me. Hello Charles, he said, his voice uncanny, a perfect imitation of mine. I was unable to reply, almost like he'd taken my voice. So I just kept watching. Do you know who I am? he asked, all polite. I shook my head. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid of the damn thing. Then he flashed a smile that made my skin crawl. I'm you, he said, and I've decided that it's time for you to go. Time for me to go? What on earth, I thought, go where? I tried to brush it off calm myself down, but my heart was undeniably pounding away in my chest, and he seemed to be getting closer to me. I tried to turn away, but even my body wasn't listening to me anymore, and he laughed at me, laughed at my predicament. It was a gravelly, sinister racket. Like I said, I've decided, so it's time you went. And with that, he stepped out of the mirror right in front of me. He took me by the arm and pulled me along the wet, tiled floor into my hallway. I wanted to fight, but I was completely unable to move, and he was strong anyway, much stronger than me. He dragged me along the hallway, my heels burning from the friction, and next thing I know, he was taking me through the apartment door, onto the concrete walkway outside. My feet were bloody now, and in my mind I was yelling. But to the rest of the world I would have been dead silent, save for the sound of my ankles dragging along the hard pavement. Before I knew it, I was in the middle of a highway, in nothing but my bathroom robe, arms still in his grasp. Ribbons of light were passing us by, but not one of the damn cars stopped to check what was going on. He turned to me then, his face illuminated by the street lamps, shadows softly strobing from the passing beams. He looked me dead in the eyes one last time and said, all matter-of-fact-like, It's time for you to go, Charles. And then he released his grip and stepped back and faded into the night. I damn near fell into the highway, stumbling I somehow caught myself. My legs were weak and uncoordinated, but I had my control again. 
and the man, well, he had vanished. Alone I stood in fear. What on earth had just happened? What did he mean? And what was he? I tried to collect myself, clearing my mind of the cloud of confusion and all the questions. I had to get back to my apartment. Certainly I couldn't stay here in the middle of the damn highway. So I made my way across the traffic and began, then journey back home, the path rope fluttering behind me in the cold night air. Every now and then I would hear a sound or catch a glimpse of something in the corner of my eye that would make me turn. And every time I turned I figured I would see the guy standing there or something. Maybe he would be watching, staring at me all expressionless. Or maybe he'd be grinning and laughing with that awful laugh of his. But he was nowhere. The man was gone. Shivering, barefoot and bleeding, somehow I made it back to my apartment. At first I was too scared to go inside. What if he was still there? But I didn't have any other options. The door was still ajar and I nudged it all the way open only to find it empty. So I went inside and slammed the door shut behind me. I wrapped myself in the first blanket I could find, and while I was warming myself on the couch, I tried to rationalise what just happened. I couldn't know. The man in the mirror had not been a figment of my imagination. I knew that for sure. He was very real. He'd been there with me, and the thought was terrifying. And then I remembered what he had said. It's time for you to go. I rushed back to the bathroom. It was still thick with the steam in there, so I had to wipe away the condensation from the glass. Then I peered through the fog into the mirror. But it was only my reflection. My eyes. And my face. And there we have it. I don't really totally get what the point in it that last one was. Like it was well written up until the end. I thought they were going to like swap places or something. I don't know. But still well written. I think that was five pretty good stories. To be fair, we had a range of why certain stories were scary, I think. So yeah, a pretty good selection. I'm now going to have to go and watch some like... Veggie Tales or ASMR or Telly Dubbies to put me in a nice, happy, positive mood so I can go to sleep because it is one o'clock in the morning, me reading these on a school night as well. Not a work night, obviously, but you know what I mean. But uh, it's worth it. That was thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable, and uh, I hope you all found it enjoyable as well. As always, if you did enjoy it and you're able to, then please give this video a like and subscribe if you're new.